Last Wednesday when I left here, God said, now this weekend, I don't want those same type of songs sung that you sang tonight. He said, I don't want those slow songs. So I didn't say anything to Aaron, but Aaron made up the praise and worship. Then he wrote me an email and said, I scrapped that one because it just wasn't getting anywhere. Then he sent me a new one and I told him because I'm trying to teach him how to go by the Spirit. See, if you be led by the Spirit, then God can move. And I felt behind me a lot of moving, a lot of rejoicing. And God wants us to rejoice at this given time because we're leaving the old year behind and we're stepping into a brand new year. And then like Brother Aaron told me this morning, this is the end of summer and we're stepping into fall. So seasons in your lives are changing. God's going to be doing new things in you and through you. He's going to be talking to you to have you do different things. So don't be caught in the old, but let's just move on with the new. All right. Father, I thank you and I praise you for all that came out into your house this morning. I thank you, Father God, they came to hear a fresh word from heaven, that they came to sit in your presence. And I thank you, holy angels who are here, Father God, going to and fro throughout the chairs, ministering to the people. Father God, we truly do thank you for your son, Jesus, in his precious blood. And Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, God wants to talk about consecrating yourselves. As, you know, as God led me through this, I realized that a lot of Christians get, you know, do the sinner's prayer but they never consecrate themselves. And so this is why God, you know, he's, he's leading us step by step by step to be the holy people that he's called us forth to be. Now, many Christians want to receive miracles from God, but they are not willing to obey him. Many Christians want to receive miracles from God, but they are not willing to obey him, live the way God wants us to live. We still want to go our own way. In order to see miracles from God, we need to, first of all, consecrate our lives. And Joshua 3, 5 says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. <clears throat> now, as you're listening to this today, as you're reading it, I want you to, to think about yourself. I want you to think where you're at with God, and I want you to think what you're really doing for God and with God. You need to understand that we're, we are in a new season and God is calling us to himself more than he ever has. You're going to find yourself wanting to talk and God doesn't want you to talk. You're going to find yourself, you know, just pulling yourself to yourself just so you're alone with God. Don't, don't try to talk when God's saying don't talk. And if God's pulling you to yourself, then you just have to go alone. Don't allow others to disturb you. You have to be following the voice of God at this given time. There's no other way. There's just no other way. We need to understand that when we live the way God wants us to live, blessings will follow, I mean, sorry, will often follow us. In this passage, Joshua tells the Israelites to prepare themselves to see amazing things from God by consecrating themselves. This was both an order and a promise, and the fulfillment of the promise depended on their obedience to the order. This was both an order and a promise, and the fulfillment of the promise depended on their obedience to the order. Whatever God has spoken in your life that he wants to do through you, Depends on how obedient you are to God doing the things he's calling you forth to do. Some of God's promises are unconditional, and all we have to do is believe them, while other promises require that we meet certain conditions. In meeting these conditions, we are not earning God's blessing. We are making sure our hearts are ready for God's blessings. In, in meeting these conditions, we are not earning God's blessings. We are making sure our hearts are ready for God's blessings. All right, the need for consecration. 
What does consecration mean? Consecration simply means that we have to separate ourselves from sin and draw near to God. Simple as that. If the experience of Israel at Mount Sinai was the pattern, which is in Exodus 19, 9 through 15, sanctify yourselves is what God says. Here, sanctify yourselves here meant that everybody bathed and changed their clothes and that the married couples devoted themselves wholly to the Lord. You find that in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 through 6. And we need to understand that in the near East, in the Near East, water was a luxury that wasn't used too often for personal hygiene. I didn't realize that until I found that, run across that. In the Bible, the imagery of washing one's body and changing clothes symbolized making a new beginning with the Lord. And as you read the Bible, every time they were going to do something for God, they always bathed. Since sin is pictured as defilement in Psalms 51, 2 and verse 7, God has to cleanse us before we can truly follow him. In Psalm 51, 1 through 14, written after Nathan the prophet had come to inform David of God's judgment against him because of his adultery with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah, her husband, O loving and kind God, have mercy, have pity upon me, and take away the awful stain of my transgressions. David goes on to say, Oh, wash me, cleanse me from this guilt, let me be pure again. For I admit my shameful deed, it haunts me day and night. It is against you and you alone I sinned and did this terrible thing. You saw it all, and your sentence against me is just. But I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. You deserve honesty from the heart, yes, utter sincerity and truthfulness. Oh, give me this wisdom. Sprinkle me with the cleansing blood, and I shall be clean again. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And after you have punished me, give me back my joy again. Don't keep looking at my sins erase them from your sight create in me a new clean heart O god filled with clean thoughts and right desires you see david was not trying to run away from his punishment don't talk david said don't toss me aside banish forever from your presence don't take your holy spirit from me restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you I like where David said, make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to other sinners, and they, guilty like me, will repent and return to you. Don't sentence me to death, O oh my God. You alone can rescue me. Then I will sing of your forgiveness. For my lips will be unsealed. O oh, how I will praise you. And that's Psalms 51, 16 through 19. But go back to verse 12. David said, Restore to me again the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Then I will teach your ways to other sinners and they, guilty like me, will repent and return to you. See why we have to consecrate ourselves so we can talk to sinners and they will repent. And verse 16 says, You don't want repentance. If you did, how gladly I would do it. You aren't interested in offering burnt before you on the altar. Offerings burnt before you on the altar. It is a broken spirit you want. Remorse and repentance. A broken and a contrite heart, oh God, you will not ignore. So what does David say God wants? It is a broken spirit you want. Remorse and repentance. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, you will not ignore. And Lord, don't punish Israel for my sins. Help your people and protect Jerusalem. See what, see what David did. He knew he sinned, but he did not want anybody else to pay for his sin. And Lord, don't punish Israel for my sins. Help your people and protect Jerusalem. And when my heart is right... Then you will rejoice in the good that I do and in the bullocks I bring to sacrifice upon your altar. David did not run away from his sin. 
he took his punishment, but I really thought it was neat how David said, don't make others pay for what I did. Amen. That should be you people in your families. If you sin, God, don't make my family pay for my sin. Don't let it go down from me to them. For it's you who is guilty, not your whole family. When Jacob made a new beginning with the Lord and returned to Bethel, he and his family washed. And after King David confessed his sin, he bathed, changed clothes, and worshipped the Lord. And you'll find that in 2 Samuel 12, 20. As the day for the crossing approached, jo approach, Joshua commanded the people to sanctify or consecrate themselves. It would have been easier to understand if Joshua had said, sharpen your swords and check your shields. But he didn't do that as they were crossing. He said, sanctify yourselves. But spiritual, not military, preparation was needed at this time because God was about to reveal himself by performing a great miracle in Israel's midst. We need to consecrate ourselves because we live in a sinful world and possess a sinful heart. And let's stop there. Go back to where it would have been easier to understand if Joshua had said, sharpen your swords and check your shields. They were getting ready to cross over. But spiritual, not military, preparation was needed at this time because God was about to reveal himself by performing a great miracle in Israel's midst. See, and God right now is telling us to draw closer to him, not go into warfare. He's not telling us to go into warfare. He's telling you to commit yourself to him and draw closer to him. Why? Because he is getting ready to drop his glory and great signs, wonders, and miracles are going to occur. And the only way you're going to be used by God in this dispensation time is if you're walking close to him, hand in hand, embraced by him continually. We need to get this together this morning. You need to understand that if you're really going to be used by God, then you're going to have to know what intimacy with God is all about. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, sins are like circles in the water. When a stone is thrown into it, one produces another. You, you've thrown a stone in the water and how it just makes the rings. All right. When anger was in Cain's heart, murder was not far off. We have to separate ourselves from the world. When Cain, when anger was in Cain's heart, murder was not far off. We cannot have any sin in our lives whatsoever. Our hearts have to be pure before God. Our thoughts have to be pure before God. We need to get rid of all sin, all manner of sin, and consecrate ourselves. I don't see that in the body of Christ. Second Corinthians 6.14 says, Don't be teamed up with those who do not love the Lord. For what do the people of God have in common with the people of sin? How can light live with darkness? That is so true. How can light live with darkness? 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having such great promises as these, dear friends, let us turn away from everything wrong, whether of body or spirit, and purify ourselves, living in the wholesome fear of God, giving ourselves to him alone. Read this again. Having such great promises as these, dear friends, let us turn away from everything wrong, everything wrong, whether of body or spirit, and purify ourselves, living in the wholesome fear of God, giving ourselves to him alone. I wished that the body of Christ would have learned this years ago. And if we would have learned this years ago, the body of Christ would be pulling people into the church instead of pushing people out of the church. Because when people come into the church, they see more sin in the church than what they've already experienced in the world. And they don't need the church because the church does not offer them anything. I was talking to somebody this weekend, this week, and I said, all right, so you say you want to do this, 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 and this, but nothing is going to work until you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I said, you can't let God out of the mix. He has to be first. But they want deliverance, and they want to do this, and they want to do the programs, this, that, and the other. But I said, you don't, you have not received Jesus into your heart, and it is not going to work. You cannot 
to cry out to God and expect him to come to your rescue. And while you're still sinning, it's not going to work. God told us, he said, I've lifted my grace from the church. The church, you know, God shed his grace upon the church and the church has kept sinning and sinning and sinning. And finally God said, okay, you don't want me. I've lifted my grace and now I'm going to go out into the highways and the byways are going to compel them to come in. Have you noticed how dark the world is getting? Have you noticed that the, the sin that's rampant everywhere? Every place you look, it's all about sex. It's all about nudity. You know, it's, you really can't look anywhere and see light. The church must become the light of the Father. We must take our light out into the world, and we have to dispel the darkness. But you can't do that if you're still practicing sin. Can't do that. In the years I've been preaching, I have seen a multitude of people leave the church because they did not want to live a pure and holy life. I just can't live like that. They say, I have to have my sin. Well, you can't have sin and God both. You just can't do that. Read your word. It's all in your word. However, consecration does not mean that we have to cut ourselves off completely from the world. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11 says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meeting the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an adulterer, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. Do not even eat with such people. He's saying, I'm not talking about the world when I say don't do that. I'm talking about the people that sit in the house of God. How many of you women might have the men to you? You. Your, you know, your life's all messed up, so somebody t invites you to church. You go into the church, and the first thing the, the deacons or the rushers do is put a, make a pass at you. Isn't that true? And you know, and you think, what's going on here? I came in here for safety, but instead I'm being molested. And this is what Paul's talking about here. Don't associate with these type of people. Separate yourself from them. We're going, you know, Jesus sat with, with the, the drunkards and everything, and he preached the word, did he not, to them? And see, we're supposed to preach the word to the world, but the church needs to get their self cleaned up because God cannot use you as you are. But then at the same time, I have to emphasize that it's helpful to cut ourselves off from our old friends who can lead us into sin. In other words, we read the scripture here where Paul says, you know, I'm not talking about cutting yourself off from the world. I'm talking about cutting yourself off from the people. But then I say, if you, if you were a drug addict, you can't go back to your old drug friends. You have to cut yourself off from your drug friends. All right, if you were, if you're into pornography and you had some people you watch pornography with, you can't go back to their house because they'll be watching pornography and grab and pull you back down in there. You hear, see what we're saying here? Those type of people you have to pull yourself away from until you become so strong that whatever they're doing is not going to affect you. But I have to say this, <laughs> I have noticed that people don't get that strong. They seem to be sucked right back in to that thing that they got out of. So be best, maybe you just cut them off altogether until they come into the house of God and they get themselves saved, right? The command of 2 Corinthians 6 tells us not to be unequally yoked. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And James 4, 4 says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Read that scripture again. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Giving yourself to God, a holy individual. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you talk, you know, if you have given yourself totally, if you've consecrated yourself totally and completely to God, and you're talking to a sinner, and you're trying to get them to understand the word, and they look at you and say, well, what do you know? You've always lived a perfect life. You know, God's always blessed you. And I said, no, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. And see, that's when your testimony comes in. Yes, I've always served God, but that doesn't mean my life was perfect because it was far from perfect. I've suffered and suffered and suffered and suffered. But I chose not to do the things of the world. I chose not to smoke, drink, do drugs, look at pornography, get into perfect. I chose not to do those things. All right? I said, don't sit there and say that I don't know because I do. And don't people say that to you? Well, you just don't understand. Yeah, I do understand. Yes, I do. But I chose to stay with God. I, I chose to stay with him even though I always went through hardship because I know my God loves me and I know there is a God in heaven. How do you know that? I don't. My word just tells me that he's there. You're not going to get an argument out of me about that. I don't have not seen him. I just know he's there. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14, make every effort to live in peace with everyone, that's sinner and saint, and be holy while you're doing this. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And you can like that or dislike that, but it's in the word. You're going to have to live a holy life. God commands each one of us to live a consecrated life, one without sin and compromise. Ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit who enables us to live holy lives. And see, a lot of problem in the body of Christ is people really have never been baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, when you go into church and say, well, you have to be baptized, and they just dip you. I think I've been dipped in every religion there is. <laughs> but finally, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and then was led by the Holy Spirit from that day forward. There is a difference. That's why when we do baptisms, we always, we, we fast, we pray, and we make sure that the people, when they, when they come up out of that water, they are baptized in the Holy Spirit too. Because without the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be able to make it. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's the fruit, fruit of the Spirit. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And he goes on to say, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let, not, let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. If we profess to be living by the Spirit, then we need to have the fruit of the Spirit, which is Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self and self control. <laughs> I think that's a very important one. We grab that we need that fruit more than anything. Well, love, we need them all, but really and truly, the body of Christ does not have self control. If they did, the body of Christ would be walking differently than what they are. Right? Israel needed to remember what type of people God was calling them to be. And you need to remember what kind of people God's calling you to be. Israel was moving into the promised land to establish a nation that would display God's character and will, thereby fulfilling the promise to bless all nations through his people. You find that in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now, let's read that again. You need to remember what type of people God has, is calling you to be. Israel was moving into a promised land. You're moving into a new dispensation of time. You're moving into a new era. Why? To establish a nation that would display a nation as people. God is trying to establish a people who have God's character in them. And they're walking in the perfect will of God and not your own will. And God is going to use us in this new dispensation of time to bring in that harvest of souls. All right? 
You have to get, you, God's telling me, you cannot justify your sin any longer. There never has been a justification for your sin, and there isn't any longer. You must consecrate yourself. You have to get free from sin. Now, Israel was to do this by living under his rule with his presence in their midst. Do you have God's presence around you all the time? This sanctifying presence would mark Israel as a holy people set apart for his work and require holy, required holiness in their lives. All right, this sanctifying presence of God will mark you as a holy person set apart for his work and, require, and, and it requires holiness in your life. If you're truly going to be used by God in this dispensation of time, and this dispensation of time that we're in is uh, preparing the second coming of Jesus Christ. God can't use you if you're defiled. He just cannot use you. You have to be living a holy life. This lifestyle would demonstrate to the surrounding nations, you know, surrounding people, the benefits of being a people living under God's rule. Now, just as God opened the Red Sea to deliver Israel from Egypt, he would also open the Jordan River and take them into the Promised Land. But that would be just the beginning of miracles. God would go with them into the land, defeat their enemies, enable the tribes to claim their inheritance. Acts 3.26 says, When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Let's go back and read that, that paragraph before that. Just as God opened the Red Sea to deliver, to deliver Israel from Egypt, he would also open the Jordan River and take them. These are miracles that God is, has done for them. God wants to do miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle in your lives. He just doesn't want to do one. He wants to keep, when he starts, he wants to just keep it going. Because then people are going to look at you and say, look how their God is blessing them. And they're going to want to follow the God. It's a shame that they have to see that. But that's what the world has to see. They have to see God's miracles taking place in your life. All right, in the original apostolic message, there was no promised blessing apart from the call to holiness. You just had to live a holy life, period. And Psalms 84.10 said, A single day spent in your temple is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a doorman of the temple of my God than live in palaces of wickedness. For Jehovah God is our light and our protector. He gives us grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk along his paths. O Lord of the armies of heaven, blessed are those who trust in you. Let's read that again. For Jehovah, I'm sorry, a single day spent in your temple is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a doorman of the temple of my God than live in palaces of, of wickedness. Have you ever watched a, a person that's in sin? They, there is not one happy bone in their body, no, hair on their body. They are, they're the most miserable people. They think they're having a good time, but when you, they're the most miserable people I've ever seen. But yet they think they're having a good time. It's ridiculous. Verse 11 says, for, for Jehovah God is our light and our protector. He gives us grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk along his paths. O Lord of the armies of heaven, blessed are those who trust in you. So you're going to have to trust in God in this dispensation of time. He's, he taught us, he said, you have to trust me in every area of your life. Did you grab hold of that teaching? Did you start trusting him in every area? But if you're not walking a holy life, trusting him isn't doing you too much good, is it? You're going to have to be living that holy life. Psalm 128 verse 1 said, Blessings on all who reverence and trust the Lord, on all who obey him. Their reward should be prosperity and happiness. The word tells us that when we live a consecrated life, we are assured of God's blessings. And it is total, this morning, saints, it is total consecration time. God needs you to concentrate yourself to him totally, 100%, holding absolutely nothing back, nothing. Some of you in here have already done that, and some of you have not. And it, you wonder why God is not blessing you. Check your walk with God. Is he on your mind 100% of the day? 
Are you living a holy life? Do your eyes stay focused on God? Or do your eyes watch every Tom, Dick, and Harry goes by? Are you drawn back to your old sins? Are you listening here? God wants to do amazing things, but are we prepared to receive them? And here is a word that God gave now. There is much deception rising in this hour, and even some of my elect are being deceived by doctrines of demons and spirits of suicide. And the lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes and the pride of life are taking out some of my soldiers whom I love. The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, are taking out some of my soldiers whom I love. In this season, I'm calling you to draw yourself away, to set yourself apart, for I have set you apart for my purposes. But you must set yourself apart for my purposes. God has set you apart, but unless you do your part, then he can't do anything with you. But he said, but you must set yourself apart for my purposes in order to step into everything I've planned for you since before the foundation of the earth. So this morning, are you setting yourself apart for God's purpose? Isn't the reason why is that in order to step, step into everything I've planned for you since before the foundation of the earth? Some of you aren't going to receive your promises. You're not going to receive what God had already planned for you before you, the seed was ever planted. Why? Because you have not consecrated yourself to God. You guys, bad things are always going to happen to you. They just are. That's just life. But that shouldn't blow you off course. It should, it should make you go to your knees. But it should not blow you off course. You should not get upset. You should not lose your love walk. You should not get angry and bitter and all this kind of junk that I see the body of Christ doing. Are you listening here? All right, God went on to say, for when you, for when you were in your mother's womb, you were consecrated unto me. And when you entered into this world, you entered a new reality where your physical senses began to supersede your spiritual senses. See that? But I want to make you so sensitive to my spirit that when you open your eyes in the morning, you begin to see angels. You begin to see demon powers, and you begin to see pictures of my glory. I'm calling you to set yourself apart. I'm calling you to consecrate yourself unto me now. Yeah, you know, I was talking to somebody this, this week, and I had read an article. Well, the guy wrote a book called The Veil, and then he rewrote it and in it he's given some instructions how to see into the spirit realm more clearly so that you can see all right so right now there's a bondage in this service this morning and brother christopher back there's been praying about it and see he says that whenever he is in a situation like that and he said he gets into him quite a bit where he's all full of the spirit of god and stands behind the pulpit and all of a sudden he's all bound up but he said that God has let him see into the spirit realm and he can see what's operating in that room. And so Brother Christopher and I, I talked, told him about it. And I, so we're now, we are now asking God and leaning on to, into that direction, asking God when, it, when we're bound up like this and there is a bondage in here, we need to see what it is so we can take care of it. So in your own personal lives, in your own homes, in your workplace, when you feel that bondage come on you, you have to be consecrated to God to the place where he will let you see exactly where it's coming from, let you see exactly who is doing this thing to you. All right? All right, God, so I'm calling you to set yourself apart. I'm calling you to consecrate yourselves unto me now. Do not wait and do not hesitate, for the enemy is raging. He is attacking left and right, back and forth, from behind and in the front. He is taking out my children one by one, and it grieves my heart. And I'm seeing that every day. You see it on the news. You see it in your email. Pastors are leaving the churches. Pastors are committing suicide. You know, And they're just doing all kind of evil. And they all of a sudden say, there is no God. I've been living all this time. There is no God. You know, and, and then other people who were following them, they started questioning, is there really a God? If there was a God, how come they quit or how come they committed suicide? Are you understanding this? God says, and I want to protect you. I want to hide you under the shadow of my wings, but you must fear my name. You must walk circumspectly to walk in the fullness of my protection. You must not look to escape my will, looking here, there, and everywhere for the pleasures of the world, the pleasures of the season. 
God said, you must not look to escape my will. And a lot of people are doing that. A lot of Christians are doing that, looking here, there, and everywhere for the pleasures of the world, the pleasures of the season. You must take your pleasure in me. You must set yourself apart from me because I have set you apart from myself and together we will go into places and see things that you did not know existed. You know, my daughter just came back from Arkansas spending two weeks with her sister celebrating her 60th birthday and they keep saying, you got to go out there and you have to just take time. You have to celebrate. No, God has not called me to do that. He's called me to stay where I'm at and to do his work. I don't have to celebrate birthdays and I don't have to do this, that, and the other. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying what I have to do. I know what I'm supposed to do with God. I'm supposed to stay near him. I'm supposed to have my ears in tune to him. And if I would do what they want me to do, you couldn't tune your ears to him because there's too much activity going on. Amen. And I would miss God and I don't ever want to miss God. I don't ever miss a church service unless I'm really super sick and that hasn't been very often but even whenever I was younger and I would travel to Pennsylvania I would get up at three o'clock in the morning and get in church so I'd be in church that morning if I can take time to do other things I can take time to be in the house of God amen it doesn't matter how far I have to travel we used to have about two ladies who traveled from Virginia I think it took them three hours to come they were here every service Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesdays. If we have revival, they were here every day. They traveled that distance because they wanted to sit in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Are you, are you listening here? They were consecrated to God. They still are. I think one of them passed away, though. Where am I at? All right. And the holiness, the co- cooperation with my grace unto sanctification. God said more and more sanctification will take you into realms that you did not know existed. The more you die out to yourself, the more you uh, in, into God you, you go. You go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper till all you want is him. You know, the, th- the pleasures of this world are going to pass away, guys. They really are. And what are you going to do when they pass away? What are you going to do in that final day when you're standing before God? Where are you going to end up at? Is a little bit of wine going to take you into heaven? Is peeking at a peak show going to take you into heaven? You know what I'm saying? Going out with your friends to dance and corrals for a night. Is that going to, well, I deserve some happiness. Well, you know, and I'm not telling you not to go and be happy. I'm not telling you that. I'm just telling you, you have to do what you know God's calling you to do. And if he's calling you to lead a fully concentrated life unto him, then you have to do that. Because if you don't do that, well, then God can't use you. And the deeper your calling is, the more the enemy fights you. He comes at you with everything he has. Everything he has. Believe me, I know everything he has. He brings all hell against you. At one point, God said he couldn't get any of his little minions to do what he had to do. So he himself has come after you. And he did. And he talked to me. And he took me through hell many times. But God said he can't kill you. So I hang on to that every time. You can do whatever you want to, but you can't kill me. And I know my God is there to strengthen me, and I know He won't allow you to do. He won't allow you to kill me, but He knows what I can endure. I can endure quite a bit. I found out. <laughs> you know, you might say, God, I can't deal with this. Yeah, you can. You just don't want to. And so what you do is say, okay, God, then whatever it is I have to go through, I'm going to go through it because I know You're strengthening me, and I know You're here with me, and I know everything's going to turn out just fine. Amen. Come on. You know, when I was talking to that person trying to get him saved uh, this past week, uh, he said, looking at you, I've never, I thought you never had any problems in your life ever. Because you're always happy. You're always encouraging other people. And I never knew you led a life like that. And I said, but the way I live does not matter, does not matter to me. Does God said I was going to suffer. God's word says you're going to suffer. It's a part of life. But God said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And I said, he doesn't leave me abandoned out in the field somewhere drunk. I can't, so drunk I can't find my way home. Right? So God's always with you. He really is. If you're committed to him. All right. So I said, in the holiness, the cooperation with my grace and the sanctification, more and more sanctification will take you into realms that you did not know existed. And the price you will 
pay will be worth it. This is God speaking. Why? Because you're not only working out your salvation with fear and trembling, but you're also ensuring that you'll cross the finish line. Read that again. And the price you will pay will be worth it. Because you're not only working out your salvation with fear and trembling, but you're also ensuring that you'll cross the finish line. Many t one time God said, daughter, don't let any man steal your crown. And I was being bombarded by hell like you wouldn't believe. Have you been going through that? Have you not? And God was encouraging me, keep going, keep going. Don't let this steal your crown right now. No, don't let this steal your salvation. And one time I was going through a lot of things and God said, daughter, he said, I am with you. I'm, I'm down in this valley with you. Keep walking, keep walking. We're going to walk this out together. See, if you're really consecrated to God, if you're really following God with all your heart, if you really died out to your flesh, God will speak to you constantly and he will lead God and direct you. He will take your hands. And yes, you're going to walk into the valleys of despair. Yes, you are. And I'm not going to say you aren't, but you're not down there alone. You're like the three Hebrew children. God is always with you. He's always holding your hand. He doesn't forsake nor leave you. And I don't care who says any different. That's, he does not. Then God said for the, Matthew 24, 13 is what he quoted. For those who endure to the end shall be saved. So you're going to have to endure. You're going to have to endure the hardships of life. So God says, so pledge to your own heart that you will decide to live a consecrated lifestyle, not just for a season, not just for a few days of consecration, but a consecrated lifestyle. I am looking for some even to take a Nazarite vow, to go to the extreme for me, to set themselves apart to the extreme for me and make some sudden changes that may shock those around you. But they won't shock me because I see you doing this. I see you succeeding in this. I see you. Now, I looked up a Nazarite vow, and it says to separate himself to the Lord. The vow of the Nazarite was to express one's special desire to draw close to God and to separate oneself from the comforts and pleasures of this world. And I read about where they, this one guy, he did the Nazarite vow, and he really gave up wine. I guess wine was a big thing then. He gave up wine and something else for a season, and he didn't shave his hair for a season and he consecrated his life. He sold himself out to God. You can look that up yourself and study that. Now, God said, if you want to see me more, pursue holiness. For my word says, does it not? In Hebrews twelve fourteen, to pursue peace with men in holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. And then God said, pursue holiness, and I will make you holy, even as I am holy. If you pursue holiness, God will help you. He really will. You know, how many times have you said, God, lead me not into temptation? You know, sometimes, you know, you're, let's say you're, sometimes somebody's done something to you and you want, you're angry and you say, God, I don't want to be angry. Help me right now. Don't allow me to stay angry. Come and lift this anger off of me. Because an angry person is not a good witness to the Father. Amen. But you're going to have to work that out yourself. You can't, somebody else can't do that for you. All right, God, let's go back to where God said, if you want to see me more, if you want to see more of God, if you want him to talk to you more, he says, pursue holiness. For my word says, does it not? Pursue holiness, and I will make you holy even as I am holy. Then God says, set yourself apart, consecrate yourself to me, for me, and I will give you the grace to do it. God, God's not going to expect you to do this all by yourself. He will give you grace. He will be with you. And God said, and yes, there will be resistance against this endeavor. Yes, there will be challenges. And yes, the enemy will come and ramp up the temptations against your heart. But my grace is sufficient for you. You find that in Second Corinthians twelve nine. And pretty soon the passing pleasures of this age will not be appealing to you any longer. You see that? As you consecrate yourself to me, those things that used to tempt you, that used to woo you, even the food that you eat, your desires will change. And I just said to my kids about six months ago, I said, I don't, they said, well, you, you always like that. I said, but I don't like those foods anymore. And now I realize it was God taking the desire of those foods away from me. The closer you get to me, God says, the less you'll desire of the things of the world. And I will use you to do great and mighty things, exploits. 
Now, do you believe God or not? He's not going to call you to do something that he's not going to be there with you to help you through it. He will give you the strength and the grace that you need to do this thing. Hebrews 12, 12 says, You have become weak, so make yourself strong again. Live in the right way so that you will be saved and your weakness will not cause you to be lost. Try to live in peace with everyone and try to keep your lives free from sin. Anyone whose life is not holy will never see the Lord. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to a place where thousands of angels have gathered to celebrate. And, you know, as I read that, I thought about God saying the angels are all around about us. If we will consecrate ourselves, we will see those angels. If we will let go of the things of the world, we're going to see those angels around about us. Amen. Come on. Then verse 23 says, you have come to the meeting of God, God's firstborn children. Their names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all people, and you have come to the spirits of good people who have been made perfect. You have come to Jesus, the one who brought the new agreement from God to his people. You have come to the sprinkled blood that tells you about better things than the blood of Abel. He goes on to say, be careful, don't refuse to listen when God speaks. He already said that, here what the scripture says, be careful, don't refuse to listen when God speaks. Those people refuse to listen to him when he warned them on earth, and they did not escape. Now God is speaking from heaven, so now it will be worse for those who refuse to listen to him. Now God is speaking from heaven. When he spoke before, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once again I will shake the earth, but I will also shake heaven. The words once again clearly show us that everything that God has that was created will be destroyed. That is, the things that can be shaken and only what cannot be shaken will remain. Then God has been shaking us, church, and shaking and shaking and shaking, and he's been trying to shake out those things that were not of him so that he could put himself totally and completely into us. So we should be thankful because we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And because we are thankful, we should worship God in a way that will pray, please him. We should do this with respect and fear because our God is like a fire that can destroy us. You know, it's really hard trying to raise up young children in this, in this dispensation of time because of all the things that are out there to pull kids away from God. And even my kids who know God, you know, I'm two little boys, every now and then, you know, they'll come to me and say, well, d d why does God do this? Or why does God say that? And they start questioning, but you have to be strong in the Lord and you have to stand your ground. And sometimes one of my boys will test me to the limit. And I said, I'm not going to change the word of God for you or anybody else. This is what we have to do. And I don't, I don't know why God does it that way. I really don't care. He is God. He is God, and it's the way we have to live. Then God says, consecrate yourself today, and even by tomorrow you will see the difference in the sensitivity to my spirit, the joy in your heart, and the peace in your soul. Consecrate yourself. So what God is calling us to do this morning is to consecrate ourselves unto him, not to ourselves, not to your family, not, you know, not to the world, but unto him. And I'm going to tell you, body of Christ, this is what's happening. If you, church, do not consecrate yourself to God, the people that God, the world that God brings into the house of God will consecrate yourself to God. They'll take your mantles. Believe me, they will, because God has told us that. And they will carry on the works of God in pure holiness. You will be standing on the outskirts looking in, and it'll be too late for you because God gave you a chance to live a holy life. We've had this sign up here ever since we started the church. God said one time, you teach these people to be holy because the, the, my house is not holy. And I've been preaching holiness ever since I started in, in, in the late, in the early 80s. And I'm going to tell you right now, I can say it with all honesty of heart, the church does not want to be holy. They don't. They do not want to be holy. They still want to hold on to the things of the world. Are you one of those? Or are you one of those that's saying, God, I, I just give you everything this morning. I don't want no more of the world. The world has done nothing but mess me up. I want you, Father. No matter what I have to go through, I want you. And I'm going to tell you, some of you in here, if you consecrate yourself to God and just give him your all, you're going to suffer. 
you're going to suffer more now than what you did before you did that. That's what happened to me. And, and the devil doesn't let up. It's day and night, day and night, day and night. He does never let up. But God's always there. He'll always see you through. There's enough out there that have consecrated yourself and are suffering, but they'll say it's worth it all.